guess I'll try signing in again. Yeah, uh, yeah. Robert, I have yeah. another technical question. <clears throat> yeah? I was told in another class that if everyone turn off their video during the actual demo, that it may save some bandwidth or... Oh, I never heard of that. I don't know if it is true, I'm just saying. Um, I don't oh. know that's choppy, yeah. Yeah, that why is, don't we do that? I mean, there's no reason why everybody needs to have their video on. I don't really see why, especially when I'm, when I'm doing my thing. Yeah, there, that's, demo. yeah, during the demo, we only I need... I never thought of that. Yeah, well, I, as I said, I'm not sure if it is true, but apparently it well, makes, it makes sense. choppy, yeah. It makes sense. I mean, you know, when I'm giving the demo right now, I guess, you know, so when I mute everybody, then we can, um, well, I still don't see you at all. I mean, I might as well forget the class because I don't see you. I only see myself. I don't see anyone else. I don't have gallery view. So, I don't so any who else in here has an I I mean, I work on the iPads up at, uh, I see absolutely everybody and, I do. and Robert and you have an I iPad, right? I see everybody. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think it's something with her computer. Maybe. I think so too. Well, you have to change the view on an iPad, so maybe I don't know. Yeah. I'm on an iPad and I I'm can see it, I think. Yeah, I, I, have wonder if have she, I see I've not had this problem before. Usually, it's the speaker view and the other, but you only have the one view. Um, well, I'll turn it off and start again. Yeah, it's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. I don't really understand. Um, Rob, this is yeah. Phoebe, and um, I was looking back through your emails. Have you ever sent out a um, materials list? I can. I can send out. I, I think I occasionally I do. <laughs> Most people have their own materials, and that's just fine. Well, I'm 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 happy using my materials, but I I appreciate and like your use of a limited palette, and I'm just trying to see what you use and see what I have that might that would come sort of close to it. I mean, it's a warm and a cool of the the three main colors. I assume. Yeah, that, that's my main thing. Is and you know I don't really use I have a lot more other than I usually use, but um. I typically use the ultramarine blue, right, and a Prussian blue, right. That gives me a warm and a cool blue, right. And then I use the lemon yellow and the cad yellow, a uh, cad yellow pale, by the way, cad yellow pale. Um, because regular cad yellow is kind of like a yellowy orange. Yeah. And then, so those are my two yellows. Uh huh. And then Which I use uh, <clears throat> magenta and cad red and okay. that gives me a warm and a cool red yeah <clears throat> and then anything else you want to throw into the mix you know you could throw in like like it's hard to make that color like an aqua yeah. or if you have like a color like this like a really good <laughs> rose yeah like what is it called uh opera opera <clears throat> opera opera coming <clears throat> Yeah, colors like that that are hard to mix. So those are those are great. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, any kind of green you want to. I mean, sometimes, you know, I mix my own greens, but after a while, you know, you 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 not only do you get kind of lazy, but you want to see like other different because they throw um, some of the greens like sap green or whatever. They're they're made with. I think they're made with uh, like an Indian yellow. Oh yeah, an Indian yellow, by the way, is a great thing to add to your palette. Now there's a transparent okay. yellow. It is? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's trans it's a it's a very transparent color. Very, very, very transparent. And yeah, because the yellow that I typically use is Hansa medium and it's not transparent. Right. Yeah. Lots of yellows are very like this this uh this lemon is extremely opaque so some are i mean you just have to learn which ones you like yeah that's really a uh that's really all i use and, and then any 
anything else you want to throw into the mix? <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I should probably. Yeah, I could probably. I mean, typically Arch is one forty. Yeah. Cold press. I've got. I'm. 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 I'm up with it. It was just the colors I was fussing with today. Yeah. 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 And then we talked about the brushes last time. But we'll keep going on. And, you know, if anyone wants me to write out a list, um, I'll do that for the low, low price. No, I'm just joking. No, I'll do that. For <laughs> no. So if you need a, a, a list of things, or you can just ask, you know, yeah. if you're interested. Uh, I'm happy to. No, that's it. I, you, shop. My, you've answered my question. That's what we're here to do. Which brand of Indian yellow? I know different brands use different pigments. Not an urgent question, but that is a good question. Um, um, uh, you're right. Different Indian yellows. Yeah, different. Uh, some of them are kind of brown, and some are really orange. You have to. I have definitely looked at different brand names of Indian yellow. I forget which which brand name I have. I, I did settle on one. It's deep in there. I don't. I don't have it on my palette. So. Jane Jane Blundell has done. Um color swatches of many different brands of many yeah. different colors so maybe that would be an answer debbie okay a way to find out could you write her name in the chat what oh yes sorry thank you bags and bags and bags but i do keep hold on a second Look at this. <laughs> okay, let's let's get nerdy. I got a bag of yellows here. Bags of yellows. Oh, yeah. so I keep them in bags because they just get too many. Okay, so this is. Uh, which one is this? I mean, this is. Well, it really depends Schminka, on the right? brand of the paint, the brand. Yeah, this is Schminka. And that's not Indian yellow. That's Turner's yellow. Okay. Here, there's an Indian yellow by Dollar Rowney. Uh, I don't know how good that one is. Here's the baby. Oh, here, now here's one. If you like Indian yellow, if you like that, if you like that uh, transparent quality, quinacridone gold. Try it. You'll love it. Yeah. It's I, wonderful. I Carl, try some today. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Ugh. Yeah. You can't open it. <laughs> Uh-oh. How do you open a tube? I mean, there's another nerdy question, huh? Hot water. Yeah? Yeah. See how brown it is? But it doesn't look like that. It's cold. No, I eat it first. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, now, I mean, once it's stuck on there, I mean, yeah, you tighten it first, right? If you were smart enough to uh, keep it on there kind of loose in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, this is a... Uh, I'll throw in some of that today. Well, you don't need much of it. No. So the, what what, uh, what George said to do was take your tube and tighten it really tight and then loosen it a little bit. Oh. So the next time... Yeah. If it's stuck on there, you just tighten it really tight and then loosen it again and it'll break the seal. That's like that's a plumber's trick. Is that a plumber's trick? Yeah. Back off just a half a to a quarter of a turn. Amazing website uh, suggestion. Jane, Jane Blundell. What was the amazing website suggestion? I'm I'm. That's tested out. That's, of, that's oh, um, okay. Jane Blundell, um, the one that Phoebe mentioned. Okay. She's Australian. She literally, she has spent years cataloging watercolor paints and an all by which pigment, which brand. It's an absolutely fabulous mm. and visual too. You know, it's not just a chit chat. It's you know all I laid out for you. You can just you know pour through. Well, you know, I have a really good book on the whole thing. It, it, it rates them all. Um, oh. Every brand name you can think of. Um, Put that in the chat. I think it's called the Wilcox Book of Yeah. Thank you. I have that book. At, it's at it's at uh, CAG, but yeah, I've got it over there. Um, they can order it online. Yeah, it's fun. 
it, it's fun to nerd out about all that stuff. And you can also figure out like where does Indian yellow come from? You know what it is, right? You guys know what it is? No. You don't know where it comes from, huh? Okay. It, well, some of you probably do. You're just, you're just, you're not gonna blow my, you're not gonna steal my thunder, right? No. <laughs> so no, you know what they do is they feed young cows <laughs> mangoes. Hmm. Just, and I think it's mango leaves actually. I think it's just mango leaves, but I'm not sure if it's mangoes or mango leaves, but I, I, whatever. I think it's the, anyway. They they eat the mango leaves, and then it's their urine. And then they, they take the urine, you know, after they pee in this big dish or whatever, big big pan, Are and you then they, they let it dry out. Are you and that's, or yeah. Are you serious? That's the real stuff. I mean, I've never tried that. So, I, but if you notice, a lot of their clothes are that color. They're stained that color, so I think that's how they get it. They can feed them marigolds too. That will color it yellow. Mar oh, is that right? Oh, I didn't know that. But is that how they make the Indian yellow, or? What? I don't know, but... That is how they get egg. You know, when you get an egg and it, the yellow and the yolk is really yellow, yeah. lots of times they're feeding the chickens with um, marigolds in there, marigold petals. I love get it. that. Wow. I never knew. Wow. Look at all these things we learn in here. This is why you have a big class. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of weird things, you know. They use beetles. What's that? Carmine? That color carmine? It's made out of beetles. And all kinds of weird stuff. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm going to draw with my... You don't have to draw with a Sharpie, but I'm going to draw with the Sharpie so it shows up better. And what... You know, we're not going to... Um, we're not going to do the value and the, and the color study like we usually do. What I'm going to do... So I want you to do a, a couple of warm-up. And just draw with anything. I'm just drawing on regular copy paper here. This is no, nothing particular. But you know what, let me, uh, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Oops. Okay. And If I do it right over here, see, I gotta watch out for my little pictures. I can draw myself a little, don't draw in there, Rob. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want you to draw me, let's draw a, just draw me a line like this. And then a line like that. I mean, I didn't want this to turn into a perspective lesson, but it kind of is. Everything kind of is. So, and then let's let's just take them down like that. Don't do the bottom, and just go like that on top. <clears throat> That's why I have the rocks out there. Okay, so if you can think, think of rocks being in a box first. I mean, really, you know what? I think of almost everything in boxes first, but, but rocks are a really good thing to, to practice on. Now, what happens with rocks, and oh, by the way, I didn't realize, I, I, I didn't even introduce this. Today, I call this the pieces and parts. And I, I don't know why I came up with that word. It's kind of ridiculous, but okay. You know what I'm going to do? Let me let me mute. And by the way, turn off your videos, and maybe we can get more bandwidth. If that's true, maybe we'll get a better picture. That would be awesome. Okay, I'm going to mute. <clears throat> question? Just unmute yourself, and then remute yourself after you're done with the question. Okay, so. If you can think this, think, choo, choo, choo. 
think. <laughs> okay. I guess I didn't need to put that little thing there, did I? I don't know how to do. I haven't done cartoons in a while. Okay. So what happens is if you could think of rocks starting off as kind of boxy, and then what happens is that they crumble. Um, as they come down from the higher, you know, the, the new rocks are at the top of the mountain. Okay. And then as they, as they, as the water erodes them, they move down, they landslide down the mountain until they get down to the foothills where they're a lot rounder, like where we live, right? If you look down in our rivers, like down in the Arroyo or anywhere around here, you'll see rounder rocks. And then those will progressively get all the way down to the beach eventually, and they'll just get rounder and rounder and rounder. So all, all the corners get kind of worn off like that. All the corners get kind of worn off. And they get bumped and messed up. But if you think of river rocks, right? A lot of those small little ground down river rocks get really round, especially as you get toward the beach. It's not a hundred percent that way, you know. I mean, sometimes you get a you get a rock that's down low that that uh, hasn't been eroded off yet, and then it, it it breaks off and it's really sharp because it's 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 down low on the mountain and it hasn't broken off yet. So you do get sharp rocks down here, but in general, that's the way things work. So. So as these rocks erode, they, they get they get broken and they break off and they do all kinds of things that might bend out and box down, come in and out and over, things like that. But in general, you still have a top. And at this, at this angle, a couple of sides. Now, like I say, all of these little hard angles I put in here could be rounded off and ground down depending on how, how much it's been in the river. A, a river will really grind a rock down. <laughs> And then this front edge right here could do all kinds of things. You, you know, it might get broken off there. You might have a, a really steep break. It might be very round. And you know, this, this part could kind of break off or something like that. So you may have a face that's sort of not so cornered here and more, maybe more round or who knows what it does. That's really kind of up to you. After a while, when you, when you study rocks, then what you can do is you can start making them up. And that's when you really, when you start making them up is really when you understand it. And then after you make them up, then you go back to looking at rocks again and you combine the fact that you have this knowledge plus you have the observation and that really makes for good, good drawing of anything really. That's the way I do everything. So typically, these are the kinds of things that happen. And then usually at the base of the rock, you may have other rocks, you know, kind of like that or whatever. You may have weeds, weeds, we could call them uh, dead, all kinds of dead stuff, dead leaves, dead um other weeds, trash, but we don't want to draw trash. Uh, and then fresh new grasses love to grow. They, they, they love to start off under a rock because, especially around here, because we have so much light and that'll usually, you know, that could kill off the new stuff. So it likes to start off growing in the, in the shade of a rock. So right down here, you'll get a lot of new stuff. Grasses. Oops, grass is and weeds. 
weeds. And who knows? And then sometimes those weeds grow up really big and they turn into branchy sticks and things like that. But typically you'll get you'll get lots of grassy things growing at the base. And those are wonderful because they anchor the rock down. And I don't know, they, 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 they kind of set it in place with a little growth around the bottom. Now, oftentimes, you know, you'll see some rocks even in my pictures here that, uh, that aren't perfect. I mean, they, they'll, they'll be just on dirt. So you don't always get this thing, but look for it. You'll, you'll see these things at the base. But anyway, it, the reason I picked that little, the picture you're looking at up there is because in the foreground, you're looking more down on the rocks. So you're looking more, more about like this perspective. Let me draw this a little, yeah, a little bit bigger. More like this perspective. So you're looking down on the rock. Here, I'll just draw the bottom too. We'll see in the foreground. Okay. Can you move it up a little? I can't see it's being cut off. That oh, it is. Oh, because it's not being cut off on mine. Why is why is it being cut off on yours? You mean just the very bottom? Okay. Let me see if I can do this. Whoops. I really jumped. Is that okay? That shouldn't be cut off. No, up just a little bit, please. Really, it's still cut off, huh? It's still cut off, and for a second there, it wasn't. Well, it oh, is I see. on mine. It should you be can see a little bit on the bottom of yours? I mean, is it just, it's the, just barely touching the bottom, right? Right, I can see the top of the new rock that you drew, but I can't see the bottom of it at all. Oh, weird. Because on mine, I see the whole thing. You know what? Maybe I've got to put the people on the side. That'll do it. And I see the whole thing as well. I, I don't know. Really I mean, I, on mine, the very bottom corner is touching the very bottom of it. Yeah, that's what I have on mine. Okay, what I'm going to do is... Oh, my, my. Yeah, I, I just want to know. It's nice to know because uh, I'll, I'll be crowding things in here as we go further in our, in our, 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 our future lessons. Mm -hmm. I want to get... You know, maybe another webcam going here. I don't know. I hope it doesn't crash my system. But I can see everything except for the lowest corner. Right. Right. Okay, I, can't so see I, I can. I can easily just move that a little bit. I mean, just not a that teeny I don't bit. Want to move it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there. Whoops. Yeah. That's what happens when I move my camera. Then it's harder. There. It's easier for me to move digitally like this. That's okay. Let's, yeah. Move it down one time. There. Per, up, up a little. Now I need to go up a little, huh? Well, this just a touch. You had it. it I can't get it. For, it's either, guys, it might be stuff. where you have located all the other photographs of the um, class members. You could maybe move them. You can move that lineup of pictures oh, of right. the class, class to the side, to the bottom, and to the top. So they probably have them on the bottom, huh? And it's yeah. taking up that space? Exactly. Yeah. You can get rid of them all together too, just by right. How do you do that? You drag the, oh. on a computer. There's a bar, a, three stacks: two, one, and a very thin one. If you go to the very thin one, all the other people disappear. The thumbnails. Oh. Go. Okay. I haven't seen that. Okay. Okay. Stacks. So let let's say in the foreground we're looking more down on this. Yeah. We're looking down on this. Oops. Oh, at least it's a little bit in there. It'll be recorded. Um, and then as we get to the middle ground, we're catching more of the side, more of the side, so less of the top. So, you know, these middle ground ones are going to be more like this. 
little bit more like that. Something like that. So not so much top. And then the ones at the very top are about on my eye level. Because I was down below. So the, the, the rocks on the top, well, you may, you may just catch the side of it like that. And not very much of the top, maybe just a touch of the top because, you know, it's a little round. So it, it really depends on, you know, what you're looking at and, and, and the terrain of what you're looking at. See, that, that's why you always need to consider this, this area. How much of the side are you catching? How much of the top are you catching? And then after a while, you don't need to really draw out the perspective. I just want you to think this. that shape that everybody talks about they call it the potato shape and they're always you'll hear these teachers say avoid potato shapes you know and I just think to myself well I live in the land of potatoes I mean this is nothing but potato shapes around where I live you know the arroyo is tons of potato shapes what what, what they're what they're trying to teach you is that you, um, there are corners to things. So you don't want to get too round on everything, but, and some of them are very round, so you just have to go by what you see. Here, what I'm gonna do over here is, yeah, see, when I, when I zoom in like this, you can't see the palette, but that's okay. I don't think this is gonna matter that much. So. On that, uh, I'm going to do this up in the corner. On on the potato shape up there on the top, it's the big one, in the right there in the. I'm sorry, in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's and, and let's make sure everybody's muted, okay? All right, and then and then. So we are catching quite a bit of the top. Now I would just throw this in kind of a box like this first. Give it a bottom, just so you can see. I mean, I can't even see the bottom in this, so just put it in there kind of lightly. So I just wanted to show you the thinking behind this. Because a lot of times what I'll do is something that looks really intuitive and I'm thinking all this. Okay, so let's go around the top. Now that we have this sort of a, a guideline around here, it kind of comes in, it goes around, and then it rounds out the top here and scoops down like this. And on the other side, it's down. Wedge is off there. And kind of abruptly changes and goes underneath this way. Maybe maybe there's no point there, but it's pretty pretty abrupt change from here to here. And that gives me the outline contour.
you know, in this case, there, there are some weeds at the bottom. I'm, I'm looking at this really, really small, <laughs> but it's okay. Let's just throw in a couple of those little rocks down below it, just to ground it a little bit. There's, there's one out here, kind of out there. And there's another little one over here, something like that. And whatever, you can add as many other ones as you want. So the, the other ones around it, give it they're, they're kind of like when we do clouds, you know, you, oftentimes you want, you want, you want little, little dangling clouds around your big cloud because usually that's the way it is. It, you, don't, you hardly ever see a cloud just isolated without any little, little clouds around it. So think of these as almost little staging components here, these little So even though this corner right here now is really rounded off, it's still, you know, can you see how you go from this, this side here to sort of a front to then a side again? And, you know, you could even put yourself a couple of lines there like that, just, just saying, okay, like this is the side, this is the front facing you, and this is the other side. There may be even a couple more, I don't know. So that's the thinking. Let's go ahead and throw a, a gray color on there. Hmm. Does require a brush. And I've got a whole array of brushes. Look at this. This is, these, these are my Henry brushes. Okay, so which one shall I play with today? All right. We've got, oh boy, it's like candy. Um, here's my General Wayne brush. I mean, I think since, oh, that's the Black Sable brush. Ooh, what's the Black Stallion? Here, here it is. All right. Okay. That's great. I was going to set the general long brush, excuse me. Um, had some stuff in there. So take uh, red, yellow, and blue. Red, red, cad yellow. Cad yellow pale, I mean, you know. I can't think of all those words. It's hard for me to even get out cad yellow. So cad yellow pale, cad red and ultramarine blue. And just look at them, it's kind of a green gray, but you know. As long as you get something in the gray, you're good. Very light on the top. And you could just leave it white. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go ahead and just put a color right over the whole thing like that. The whole thing, try not to get it too watery. Over the whole thing, and then that, that top is a little dark, so let's just go ahead and dab that with this. And you could just avoid it if you like. You know, some people would just leave that white and then come back in and put in a little bit on there. Either way, it's fine. I do a lot of both. These are really... Now we got to let that dry up a little bit because if we keep feeding colors into there, it's just going to explode all over the place. So I've got a great idea. With that color you just used, Let's do another one in the same shape, but watch, watch how I do this. We're just drawing with the brush. And you know what, if you don't get the perfect shape of that, don't worry about it, just... on something like that. 
start off with. And there's, there's that little friend down below there. You got the little... Right, other little rocks around there, and you can, you can do anything you like. That's what I usually do. You know, some mines, I have mine up at a little bit of an angle, so it's pooling up at the bottom. You know, so that you can use that to your favor sometimes. But in this case, it's probably going to make them a little dark. I'm going to take up a little bit of that. And with my rag, I'm just going to dab the top like that. Look, you can see them how they're laying out already. I mean, it looks better when you do it th this way, but I mean, this is the me this is the very mechanical way. It's very, very, very intellectual way. But you will get there that way. After a while, once you've once you've learned this, you'll just think that as you're doing these. And your, I was gonna say your rocks will come alive, but I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe I was selling myself a little hard on that one. Okay, so I don't know about yours, but mine's tacking up pretty good there. Let's get some dark on the bottom and I just add more blue. I mean, more red, yellow, and blue. And then of course you wanna add more more blue to it because that's going to make it darker. I've got this super zoomed in. See, that's why if I had the other webcam, it would still be like right up here. Okay, I'll do that. I didn't know that before. Okay. I, I can order that. It's not a, it's not a big expense. See now that's not just taking off because we waited a little bit a little bit longer. It's still wet in there, so I can see it's still taking off a little bit. But so let's get it dark at the base. Typically it'll be dark at the base. Because no light gets down there. Oh, not so dark over here, huh? Maybe a little bit underneath, yeah. And then it just fades up. And so what you can do is just, just add with a damp brush, just a little bit of water and pull that up into the, pull that up into this. You can, if you use kind of a broken stroke, it'd look kind of rocky. You know, rockish, is that the word? Because rocky sounds like Adrian, Adrian. You guys know how to paint a rock. Let me show you. All right. Adrian will show you. Hey, Adrian, come over here. Sorry. I'm going to quit apologizing because I'm not really sorry. <laughs> okay. And. Okay, so these little rocks over here have little shadows to them too. I'm just gonna paint a little bit of, like, very much like this. It, it just make sure you leave a light side. This one over here is just a very little bit in shadow. I'm sorry, just a very little bit of light right there. This one right here is mostly in shadow. It's coming out of the deep shadow under here and that's why it appears a little lighter. And so on with this one. And they'll all get a little dark at the bottom. It always helps to throw something like a little bit of a shadow down below, because that'll ground them. And you'll come want to come back with some dark stuff right around things like that just to sort of set them off there'll be dark stuff underneath there 
really dark stuff under there. You might not get hardly any light under here. Is there, I, I, you know, I, mine's so small, I can't see if there's weeds under there or not, but. Kind of a little bit there, I'm about the base there. So sometimes if there's not any weeds there and I want there to be, I just put them in anyway. And so take the same red, yellow, and blue and add a little more yellow and blue. And you get kind of a greenish color. We can throw some of that in the, in the shadow. It'll just turn dark, but it'll kind of ground things. Just throw little bits, bits over things like that at the base. And then as you come out over here into the light, it'll appear lighter because it's not mixing with the shadow color. And if you use a, if you notice the end of my brush is getting kind of split. So if you just split that a little bit more, you can get real grassy strokes. We'll keep practicing those. And since it's on my brush, I'll throw a little bit down here. Usually there's grasses and things at the base of rocks. Not always. And I just put the grass on there because I already had it on my brush. Why waste it? And so, we can hit darks at the base of this. I kind of did this one, yeah, like, that's fine. Darks at the base like that. And then while that's wet, just take a little bit of water and see what happens is it's rolling out into the light, right? Because it's round, it's, you know, round. So as this rolls out into the light, it gets a little bit. And using choppy strokes is good because it's, it's rocky. So we got the dark, we got the medium, we got the lighter gray. And then how about a transitionary gray right here? In between the shadow and the light, you get a half tone in there. That's mine's a little bit on the dark side. I want it, I want it lighter than this, but darker than that. Just a little transitionary value in there. Yeah, we'll just bring it back over this. And you can get as articulate with this as you like. You know, you'll see little bumps and dips and divots in it. And so you just, you can just pop a couple of those in there. Little. And even the light, you might get a couple of little, little things in there. If you hit them too dark, see how they, they, it breaks too much and it just looks like a little mark. What, what you can do is just, just put them in a little bit lighter like that. Put too many of them in there, you'll kill your light. Just a couple. And they're half tones, so they should be about like this value right here. So just a couple of those and that's it. You get a hard edge like this and you want it softer, just break it down. 
Add a little water. And so on. I can just. Whoops, I got red on me. Um, inevitably, with a watercolor, you're going to have to make it darker, right? You see, I have a harsh transition right here. So let me get this off my brush. Some dark stuff there. And add a little bit of water. Just a little bit of water. And so on. We can just keep keep working on it. It's that whole idea of light hitting the top. You get lights in your shadow on the side, so that makes the shadow lighter. And then toward the bottom, you don't get much light in the shadow, so that's why it's dark. So that's why you almost always want to dark, darken things at the bottom to sit them down. Like this one. I give him more planes than I did this one. Heck, you know, if I if I mess up, I just break out. The good old gouache here. This is a big old tube of it too. I mean, here's the normal size of a regular watercolor tube. Look at this size. Weesh, that's big. So, you take a little white if you like, and give them any size. Like for instance, I lost my side over here. Um, maybe, maybe I can give it a more of a side there. Again, if you need permission, which you shouldn't, if you want to validate yourself or something like that, just think, you got to look at Sergeant's rocks all the time. He's, he's glopping big old things of white on there. And then oftentimes you'll see him do it without any, uh, any white at all and, and do it just as masterful. So you can also use white to kind of clean things up on the top. Sometimes what happens is you get a little, you get a little hook, a little bump sticking out, even in the shadows, and you might get a little bit of something on there. So if you hit that like that, a couple of those little, not too low, because that would be down deep into the shadow, especially right here in these transitional areas. You might get some rocky things sticking out. Bumpy. Sort of rocky things hanging out. So those are fun. And I, I put them in really too bright like that and then later on I'll just, I hit them with a little bit of a glaze. So they're not too bright. And sometimes they are really bright, but You should really wait for this to, to dry up a little bit, but I just hit it with a little glaze like that. See, see how it got a little mushy on me? That happens. Sometimes that mushiness works to your benefit too. You just have to get in there and make a whole bunch of mistakes. Huh. Use this to kind of shape things. And Sometimes the white runs into your other color and you go, oh no, and then you look at it later and you go, wow, that looks pretty good. <laughs> That's how you learn. So. Here's some rock ideas. Just think boxes, always boxes. If you put them in boxes first, you will understand the planes and it can really work out for you. Let's go to paths. Is that this one? Uh, oh wait, this one. Yeah, there's a path. And turn that one off. And I can 
if I know I, I was, you know, put this over here. Okay, now I'm going to come over here and zoom out. seeing okay <clears throat> so this is the poppy fields you know what I should have my uh... am I talking to myself out loud <laughs> there's the photos nice and big now I can see it okay here's the thing about paths well, here, here's what I want you to do. Let's go. Let's go back to our other little piece of paper here. Let me see what you're seeing. I'm just gonna move this over. And I want you to draw a horizon line like this. So I'll just draw the lines over here. I want you to draw a horizon line. Put yourself two little dots out of the sides like this. And then draw, draw me one like this, like this, this, and this. This is something I want you to do all the time. This little exercise right here will help you so much in, in not only drawing paths, but all kinds of things. Now, draw me another one like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And they don't have to be perfect. Something like that. And then, One, you, let's let's take one way over here, real. In fact, let, let's just split this in half. From here to here, like that. From here to here, like that. If that's getting too complicated for you, don't worry. We're just all I want you to do is have a whole bunch of lines really close to each other out here, like this. Really clo cro close, close. And I was hoping these lines would sort of guide you. And what happens is that these lines get a little further apart as they come at us. See how that works? Big, smaller, 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 smaller. Don't worry, because we're going to do it again. And then let's make these ones really cl close to the horizon up here, like this, really close. Just draw right over your other lines, really close, a little further away, and see. But can you feel how the land feels like you're looking more down on it here? And then here, it looks like you're looking more over the top of it. And then here, you're almost catching the side. And that works really well for our path, but let's try it again. Um, I'll give you a minute. I, I know I'm going kind of fast here. Let me slow down here. So here's 
what I did on the last one. <clears throat> about about halfway between these two. So let's make one around here. And you know what I'll do? I'll just I'll just we'll just do this one first. So then all of these ones I want really close to the bottom there, a little further away, a little further away. And that's pretty good. Good enough. And here again, uh, let's put one in the middle. And here we go, this one further away. I mean, sorry. Close together, a little further away, a little further away and so on. And it makes them feel like they're getting smaller as they get further away. So this one would be really good for clouds. So, okay, so this would be like, you're really catching quite a bit of the bottom of a cloud there. Toward the horizon, you're gonna be catching more of the side. And then here, you know, it's about, 50 50 you're catching the side and the bottom here so I guess over the bottom <laughs> I should have said 50 50 we'll pull this over or under under the bottom In other words, 50% of the side, 50% of the bottom. If that doesn't make any sense to you, um, don't worry about it because we're going to do it again. This is, gosh, this, this formula right here is just, just the basis of so many things in landscape. This is just something you... Watch, here's what you do. This is, I'm going to make this really simple. Hopefully, I, I tried to make that simple, but I'm going to try to make it even more simple. Do it again. Try your, uh, take your little, your little lines. You got your horizon line here, and these are your two points on the horizon line. You, you could also do this with one point. I mean, two points... Now, now, let's just take this really close to the bottom, like that, and then a little bit further apart, not very much, and a little bit further, a little bit further, and so on. together but that's okay and then do it again on the bottom we're just gonna make it really close a little further away as it comes at your eye it gets bigger and bigger this one out. So you can see it already. It almost feels like it's going into a tunnel there. I'll give you a minute to figure or to put that down there. the same thing on the other side. So we just did the same thing we just I showed you, but a little further away, a little further, 
further, further, further. I mean, it's kind of a, just a cool thing to draw anyway. Same thing on the top, a little further, further, further. And it really doesn't matter if you can't draw perfectly straight. It, 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 it won't matter. <clears throat> because, so as things go back in space, they appear smaller to the eye. So they call that convergence. You'll hear people say it's converging. That's what they mean. Converging. So if you have two or if you have a whole bunch of light posts and you're looking at them and they get smaller as you get further away, even though your brain knows they're the same size, they appear smaller to your eye. That's convergence. And so, right, if this were a straight road, like in a city, can you see how in a city, this right here would feel like it's vanishing in, in space? I could, I could have little lines in the road. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as they get further away. Much bigger as they get towards you. So, okay, and that's, it's actually easier to do cityscapes in some respects because it's so geometric and blocky. You can see it really well. But now if you're looking at a A, a, a picture of a path. Well, if you look at our picture of our path here in the poppy field, that was a lot of peas. <laughs> picture of the path in poppy field. Okay. Over here, it kind of goes uphill, let's say over there. I'm just going to give it kind of a, like a zigzaggy edge. And then it goes this way. And then Let's, let's take this other side here. Kind of goes like that. It's kind of a fuzzy edge. And it goes past there a little bit and then it kind of goes like that way. And then, see what happens is we were looking across the path here so it gets thinner. And we're looking up the path. This is on a, on a slight uphill too. Um, we're looking up the path here so it really faces us. And that's why the path appears wider here because it's facing us and you're you know you're look it's below your eye line so you're looking more down on it and in general that's the kind of thing that happens um it's a lot more intuitive. It doesn't set up, obviously it doesn't set up in perfect little lines like a, like a grid would. But as you can see, as the, the path faces your eye, it gets wider. So you can see why, even though your, your brain probably knows, can figure out that, that this distance here from there, from the, from this side of the path to this side of the path here, it's probably the same as this. But because you're looking across it, and you got, you know, you've got stuff overlapping, it 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 makes it appear smaller, even though your brain knows it's larger. So you'll want to make that the same size because your brain's saying, hey, you know, it's the same size. I know it's probably close to the same size. And then you do it like this, and then you and then you look at your your drawing, and it looks like this. Right? It just, there's no overlapping, in other words. It just feels like it's just going uphill. <laughs> so what happens is you get stuff overlapping. Right here, 
and that's why it's getting smaller you know plus you're looking across it so also there's just reasons why that path gets fat in some areas and thin in the others even though it's probably about the same width all the way around and then so as you're getting some overlapping here so it's starting to get smaller and as the path goes more over this way it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller So it's that overlapping of grasses and poppies and things like that that makes it, the path um, get smaller. But as it comes out and faces us, that's why it gets wider and you see so much more of it. And if you'll notice, I'm drawing it on this little grid here. It gets, as you're, uh, let me see my picture here. you just get so much more overlapping back here that you just lose the path altogether. But you will see it kind of uh, show up once in a while. And the places where it shows up back here is usually where it's facing you like this. And you, you'll you get a little patch kind of showing up once in a while. And then it switches back and switches back. And then the closer you get to the horizon, the less and less you'll see of the path because you have more weeds and poppies and such overlapping it. And it's just like that in every field. It doesn't matter what the vegetation is. These are the things you want to keep in mind. I mean, there's a lot more to drawing a path than just drawing a path. I mean, it, it seems like the easiest thing in the world. You try doing it, why won't the thing lay down, right? Because you're not getting enough overlapping. Your switchbacks probably aren't switching back violently, like or severely enough so this one this this one went in this direction then it went over this direction then it went over this and this and this so by laying out a subtle grid like this and you don't have to be this technical about it but but by laying out a little bit of a grid you get um you get the lay of the land And sometimes the lay of the land is real bumpy and, and uh, with small hills in it. And you'll get little high spots and low spots and you have to be aware of it. That gets a little more complicated than just drawing this. And my drawing class at, uh, we go in depth on that in, in the drawing class at uh, Creative Arts Group. But anyway, this little idea of drawing out a grid before you do something in, in landscape painting um, will help you so much. So that's mainly what I want to talk, talk to you about with, with uh, so let's paint one, right? Let's do that. We didn't even paint one. So Ron, hey. So let me just ask you, those lines that you have there, is the path always going to follow on those angles or you're just using no. that to kind of make sure you turn the right way, like at the right angles? Yeah, in other words, yeah. I, I don't know how I'm asking the question, but... I know, it's a tough one. <laughs> this this grid will, get, will help you to get things to lay down instead of turning up on you like this. So if... If I have, in other words, if I have a path way back here and it turns, it's, it, it's not going to turn like this probably unless it's going down a hill. Okay. It's going to turn, it's going to go more like this way back there. And then as it comes up here, it's going to be more like this. And then as it, as you come down here, it's going to be more like that. So Rob, can we call this a plan grid? Plane, right? Plane grid? Sure. Yeah. They, they call it uh, the ground plane. You call that the ground plane. Ground plane grid. 
Okay, I think I was confused here that we did above the horizon line. So I was thinking, oh, wait a minute, how are we going to use that? But we're just really taking it up to the horizon line. You put the other lines up there to look at clouds or perhaps trees. Yeah, or we're going to do, cl we'll do clouds after this. Okay, got it. Or, you know, yeah, well, let's just, let's just do, let's just do some path. Let's do a path. And I put a couple of pictures of paths on there. Let me go down to my, uh, whoops. There's a path, there's two paths, okay. So, I mean, the poppy field is a little bit more on a hill, whereas the one at Eaton Canyon down below with the mountains is flat, pretty darn flat. So, thinking, thinking about all this stuff, okay? Let's just come over here. Let me move my stuff over there. Okay. And then let's just draw out a path really quick. Um, you don't have to draw out the grid, but I want you to think about the grid. In other words, that let's say your pathway up here would be really flat. And then as you come down here, you're starting to see more, more, uh, more path. Can you see how it almost forms the letter S? So, so when you're doing Robert, paths, I want you to think of S's. Robert, may I ask, are you using the photo that is one in parentheses number 14? Or... Something? Aren't they up there on the screen? Oh, are they up there on my screen? Oh, I see. So you're yeah. not going to do the mountain. Oh. You're only doing the um, the path. I'm I'm, do, I'm going to do this uh, the poppy field first, and oh. then I'll show you the mountain. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have. I should have names for these. Yeah, they're the one I'm work the the one I'm working on is just the path poppy field. But you notice how I, it it comes over here, but it slims down because of the stuff overlapping it. And then it, it kind of almost comes straight at us, right? And then here you have a, another little, little trail coming up back over that way. And that's because all this stuff overlaps it and so on. Something more like that. Uh, there we go. <laughs> and you could draw it all out like this. You could even draw out your little overlaps if you like, and you get quite a bit of overlapping back here. Here, you don't get very much overlapping because you're looking right up the path. You could throw in a couple of things on the side there if you like. Now, I don't usually draw all this stuff out. I do a lot of it with my brush. But what we can do here is, how about, I mean, there's many different ways to approach this, but uh, how about we just start off with the green, the green grasses, and I'm just gonna use my brush here and just, that's how easy that is, wow. If you want to throw in the little poppies, you can do that too. You don't have to. I mean, this isn't really a poppy painting, but if you like, you can throw in a couple of those little. We could get really crazy about them. And... Okay. all this stuff on the side there, like that. You know, since it's on our brush, why not just take it all the way up to the top? And then we have 
more poppy stuff, more poppy stuff. You know, it's even in the poppies, you see much more. You're looking down into the poppies and they're much bigger here. As you get toward the horizon, they switch back and they get much more horizontal. They, they fall into clumps, horizontal clumps as you get further away. I just made myself a dull green. You know, honestly, I just added out of that red, yellow, yellow and blue mixture we had, I just added some yellow to it. If it gets too brown, I add a little bit of blue. More over here. See, I'm bringing them up and over, up and over. The path up and over where you get the overlaps that's where you want to get it that's where you want to really you'll lose part of the path once in a while and after a while you this little trick here you can just start making up your own paths and that's when you really understand what you're doing when you when you it's important to make things up now also you'll get little little spots of the uh, foliage whatever you call it, the, the brush, it, it kind of pulls up and into the path a little bit and then you overlap. Can you see a couple of places over there where it's, it's kind of coming into the path a little bit and then overlaps like that. Now this bottom, the bottom of this, this little outcropping here, it'll get flatter on the bottom as you get toward the horizon. These will get flatter and flatter but as you get toward here, they get rounder and rounder because this is closer to your eye. Just always have to think about what's closer to your eye and how it acts and how things act that are further away. And uh, just remember our little line trick here. As things get toward the horizon line, they get flatter and flatter and flatter. <laughs> Even though your brain knows that that stuff back there looks like this stuff up here. It doesn't appear that way because you're, because here you're looking down on it and here where you're looking way, you're looking at all kinds of things overlapping it way off into the distance. And then because we have a light source coming from the right-hand side on this, your shadows are going to be on the left-hand side of each little patch. Like, that's the reason you get darks over here. If you could think of this, if you could think of this, all this brush here is, as it's right next to the path, creating a little bit of a wall like this. So even that foliage has a side to it. That's why all this stuff on the left-hand side over here, is, it's in shadow and it casts little shadows onto the ground. So I know I just boxed it in to make it really, really obvious. But here's what, here's what happens. As you put these shadows down, you just kind of create a little bit of a wall like that. not 100 percent everywhere because things are it's 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 nature it's you have to improv with it but that's the general principle right there even up here you'll get little little shadows happening in there it's mostly on the left hand side of things and then you don't have, the sun's up pretty high in this case, so you don't have long cast shadows, but you could. It's certainly something that you could, you could just throw in there something kind of bluish. Little shadows on the ground. I, I think longer shadows are nicer to look at. 
If I can't see him in the middle of the day, sometimes I just make him a little too big. A little something in there. And again, those will get flatter and flatter and flatter as they get up higher. See all these little steadies? You can do these on your own. You don't have to do this big thought out thing. You can do little studies. You wouldn't believe how these little guys turn out to be wonderful. Wonderful. You will, um, you want to like cut them out and put them up, paste them up in your sketchbook because they make, in fact, I'll argue, you might even want to take them out and paste them on a card. It's the best, right? A handmade card. Who doesn't love that? Especially in this day and age when you just, nothing's handmade, right? It's nice to see something real. Okay, and then whatever the color of is the dirt you have, this is kind of a, it's a very light colored dirt. I'll just, very light, just give it a little bit of something in there. Maybe a touch of orange here and there. I take it right over the shadows. If your shadows are too wet, it'll just turn into mush. I mean, I oftentimes put my stuff on pretty dry, so it dries fast. And that kind of thing. So we could definitely put more detail in here. And, but that's, that's not the lesson. The lesson is paths. always look for that can you can you believe these little things create like a wall like a wall and that's why the the left side of this this big area of foliage will create little shadows and you know you get in the right light and you can really see this principle i mean it is very very obvious sometimes it's hard to see if you look at the the, the picture i did and the picture with the mountains in it that's down below they also, it has a path in it as well. Uh, let me see. Um, there it is. That's a maybe a little bit easier to read. What, what you can do with that kind of deal is let's just yeah. Well, I am already over there. Okay. What I'm going to do here is just, I'm going to zoom into this. Zoom into zoom. I'll move this one over a little bit. So for the mountains, if you want to draw the mountains in there, you could. Um, let's draw the edge of the path, okay? Now, this left-hand side of the path is almost straight at us. I mean, rarely in nature we ever see anything straight. So, but let's just start it off straight at us like this. I'm not drawing that, I'm not gonna draw that dark because I wanna lighten it up later. And then way back here, way back at the base of the mountain, it goes like this. And I know there's all kinds of switchbacks, but watch, just do this. Just do that. It's easy. If you want to put the mountains up there, you can put some mountains up there. Not really the what I was thinking about doing. Something sort of like that. I am telling you, drawing rocks and paths will help you so much. It'll help you not only in landscape, but it'll help you in all drawing. Because it really what it is, it's just an understanding of 
how things appear to your eyes and that takes a, a fair amount of uh, perspective really does perspective helped us helped humans to see things as they are really all perspective is is knowledge it's the knowledge of observation visual observation okay so let's go back here in the back here let's let's start off with that bush way at the back there's like a little bush like that i'm just going to draw just like a big c shape there and then if you notice there's another bush right in front of it i'm not giving them bottoms i've got another bush right in front of that and then this big bush in the foreground that and then way over here you get another bush kind of coming off over there you're overlapping 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 that's what you got to know about um about everything in in nature overlaps and now We've got this taller brush that's kind of way back there. We'll just, that's right up against the mountain. Or that's a light stuff up against the mountain. I know there's probably trees and stuff way back there. I'm not really drawing those. Just the light stuff there. And then you get another little overlapping. And then, and then you get this other bushy stuff over here that overlaps the path and comes down about like this. Comes about like that. And then all this uh, dead grass right here. And it just kind of switches back. And that's how you get that uneven line. So what we can do here is just erase out our guideline. I did throw on the bottom of that one, didn't I? And then Let's put in the bottoms. Let me erase that out. So way in the back, you've got the one that has a bottom. And it just kind of flattens out because they're going to be really flat back there. And you got another one too that flattens out really flat. And then the third one, it's pretty darn flat too. But as you start working your way into the foreground, they get more and more round on the bottom. And that, that makes them come at you because you see more of them, more of it. Now, um, in this case, we're not seeing all that much. And that's, that's, that's nature. It's not perfect. It, it, it's, a uh, it's natural. <laughs> oh, I forgot this one's really overlapping. This one is quite, a, it's, it's actually way up here, but if you see, if you look at the bottom, it kind of comes more like that at you. Let me erase this. And you see, as they come, the bottom will get rounder and rounder as it comes at you, way up into the foreground. We don't really have a lot of foreground in this. Well, they're pretty flat. But this one should be rounder at the bottom than these back here that are really flat. And so what creates all of these little pieces that come out into your path like this, out into your path like this, out into, is because you have rows and rows of dead grass overlapping, 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 etc. And so they just, they create, that's the shape they create. Because if you were to look down on that, if you were to look down, if you were standing way up here and you're looking down on this, it would be much more like this. Is that even in the picture? It would be much more like this. Instead of... Because this is closer to your eye. Your... That's also... All right. So we've got these little... I'm coming there, and you got a couple little... Little things like that, just switchbacks. I, I call them switchbacks. Now I know it, it 
it's hard to think of bushes as just little, like weird little geometric funny shapes like that. I know I, I've really uh, over overdone the uh, simplification of it, but you know sometimes you just need to see it simple like this. And I know there's all this good stuff on the top, but that really complicates things. Because if you see it simple like this, notice how you know the, the light's coming from the top right hand side and it's pretty low because you're getting these long cast shadows so so as the form goes in right around here you'll see everything starts turning into shadow see it's like a big area and then it comes into shadow along this side here again on the side this part's in light and this part goes into shadow and they cast these long cast shadows across our little path. In fact, this one looks like it's so long it's going over to the other side, which I like. Again, uh, um, if you'll take a look at these shadows, they're not perfectly evenly spaced because it's nature, but can you see that as the shadow comes towards your eye, they're further apart, and then they get closer together, and then what happens is they get Back here, they're so close together, you can't see any gaps in it anymore. They become almost one. So, so interesting. This is why, you know, oftentimes when I'm, all, all, of course, I always mull over this stuff. But it's nice to just take a day and and. Um, and isolate these little things and, and talk about all the little pieces and parts we put to, we put in a painting pieces and parts we put in a painting and um okay i'll put it all together in other paintings okay so i'm gonna make a green again got all kinds of greens here i'm not so concerned with getting the color perfect but i'm doing this upstroke here and the reason i'm doing that is because think about it i mean Everything's going up. So just. That's something I'll do with whatever I'm drawing or painting. I, I'll, I'll go with the form. That will be, I, that will come instinctual after a while. Notice my, my brush here is split because it's dry, so I'm just going to keep. Just looking for something like that, kind of brushy. Same with these over here, They're, you know, use whatever color you want. I've got the sagey colors in there too. I love the bluer, the bluer greens are nice. I'm just going to paint right over my funny little forms right here. So the way I laid that in is the way I usually lay in a whole, I would just look at that whole big area off over here as one big area of a million bushes that create basically one big bush to me. And they get, this is the light of them. You could put all kinds of colors in there. Want some dead stuff, get some orange, you want some pretty little young green do that at the bottom here and there some green stuff in there whatever you like the color doesn't matter in this case but you know what it's always fun to play with color I do it all the time it doesn't matter what I'm doing I'll, I'll get lost on the color that's painters that's usually why painters paint they would they would rather paint instead of draw they prefer to paint and that's the reason why is because you prefer color or at least that's what you're into at that particular time okay now i'm, I'm going to take some of these now if you look at the shadows on the ground i know they probably look gray to you but if you can let your eye be sensitive to the shadows um 
can you feel the blue in the shadow? And there, there's a bunch of reasons why it's blue. In this case, because we have very light dirt. And it doesn't have much color of its own. It's sort of a very, very light beige, which makes, which means the shadow will take on more of the colors around it. Whereas if there was a shadow over something very orange, like you were in Utah or something, you wouldn't see the blue in it as much. So this is, this is also a really good example of how a shadow will take on the colors around it. Uh, as well as the color that it's casting a shadow on, in this case, the dirt. So do you paint the dirt first or do you paint the shadows first? I mean, I painted the shadows first and this time I'll do it again. Uh, I do it both ways. I don't have any particular. Now I prefer to go with the ultramarine blue because uh, it's not so green. And the green blues kind of look more like they, they begin to look more like a sage or something. So, but uh, kind of a long one here in the front. And then as they get further away, they get closer together. You get a whole bunch of them just turn into one. Here you probably see more, more little splits in them. And then back here you won't see as many splits because they're so close together they just turn into. But there's our principle, right? There's this principle. And the photo is a good example of it, and the painting is a good example of it because we have things getting closer together as they get further away from our eye. Now, while that's drying up, let's give little sides because, you know, this won't get as much shadow because um, this is mostly catching light. But we're seeing the shadow side of all of these little, little balls of... Uh, foliage so if we take our green and add more blue little blue and red to it we'll get something that creates little shadows and then if you notice at the base it's at the very base where you get your darkest shadow just like the rock you know you just use a more crumbly fuzzy stroke like that just split your hairs apart about like that and you could just you could just pull it up maybe that, that might be a good stroke now they're getting you're getting too far apart to do the ones way in the background so I just close them up I just use I just use I use my finger like this to bring them together and I use my fingers like that to pull them apart after a while you just be doing that unconsciously I, I do it so much I forget that's why it's important for you all and when you when you have a question or whatever just unmute yourself and just remember keep the questions Obviously, you, you guys are very, very, very good about it. We'll keep the questions toward the lesson, you know. Although, you know, the, class, the questions before class were great. I love talking about all that stuff. I think it upsets people, though, when we get off on little tangents. So... So you see I'm keeping most of my shadows off to the left side, this stuff on the right side is mostly in light. And here's another little trick. And 
the, the photo is a good illustration. It, as you can see, the, as the shadow gets closer to the bush, it's blocking more light. So it, the shadow itself gets a little bit darker toward the bush. And then as it gets underneath the brush, it just gets really dark. So that's a that's kind of a gradation. So I, I usually throw my shadows in like that. And also, the, it might get grayer too. And the reason why it gets grayer is because it, not as much sky is influencing it up here. Again, the, the bush is blocking it. So a little bit darker in the shadow. And then I just sort of massage that, that value all, off into the shadow, the rest of the shadow, and leave it the bluest out here and the darkest and the grayest over here underneath the object. So this is where you're gonna get your most blue in a shadow. Rob, you, yeah. when you first put the shadow in on the side, your brush strokes were going up, like you were making them more vertical. Yeah. And then under, right, that way. And then underneath on the shadow, as you come towards the yeah. path, you're tr turning towards horizontal, correct? Yeah, and you, you certainly could do that. Now, I'm looking at these particular ones. Now that I take a good look at it, uh, you get a lot of really vertical things happening in there. So you might want to just you put them down in all vertical spots. I, I'll i notice that as you get toward the uh, horizon, you can just kind of do more of that really horizontal. But if you want some of those, those little light weeds and things like that coming out then just really you could go down you could go up if you if you kill too much of it you can always come back with a little bit of white and pop in a couple but we want it dark right underneath the object and as you can see it's a sporadic dark it's not perfect and that's but that's what i think about Every time I'm doing foliage, you got the form, you've got the light and the shadow, darker underneath the object. I mean, it's hilarious. The, you want to, <laughs> this is the connection you'll make the more you paint. Um, let me see. That the, let me put this over here. It's not that much different painting a rock than painting foliage. The only difference is the edges. See, we got scruffy edges over here. We got harder edges over here. Isn't it funny? So, so toward the end of the painting, the edges are a huge deal. Toward the beginning of the painting, the shapes are the big deal. So you could put everything in hard edge shapes. Kind of like I laid the beginning in. And then come back and fuzz all your edges if you want it, if you want fuzzy foliage or leave them really hard if you want things to look like rocks. So if you've ever wondered why your foliage looks like rocks, it's the edge. It's the edge. So if you're taking notes, the order, uh, let me write it up here. You guys have heard me say this before, but number one is shape. So one, two is value. So what value are things? Shape is number one, like, you know, what's the shape of my mountains? Then number two, what is, it, what is the value of my bushes here? Let's say for instance, number three, the color. This is bumping up on me here. And the last thing is the edge, four. So isn't that interesting? And 
it's in that order. That's why I put one, two, three, four. So if you think about edges right in the very beginning, you're probably you're probably going to have a painting that gets overly complicated because you got too much detail into it too quick. Really think think more about the edges as you're as you're going along. Now I'm just throwing a little bit of color for my dirt. It's very light. I just paint it right over the shadows. The harder, you know, the more I work on the shadow, the more it'll start picking up that color. So very lightly over those shadows, something like that. You could do it that way. I, I certainly could have laid in the color of the dirt first, let that dry, and then glaze my shadows over it. It works both ways. I don't have a specific order. Whoops. We've got, wow. Okay. We've got some paper here. <laughs> We've got paper and I know how to use it. Okay. On this one, let's go back to here. Clouds back here along the horizon. They look you basically you're only catching the side of it. You hard you hardly see any of the bottom of a cloud way back there. Giving this a little bit more, more of a side there. But you know, you don't really. As you get toward the horizon, you see very little bottom. As you come up here, now I can take, I can take these down to that point, these down to this point, like that, and you're seeing quite a bit more of the bottom of it. See, see, it's about 50-50 side of the bottom. About. And then as a cloud comes up and over you, you, you see nothing but bottom. And that's, that's tough. You know, I used to paint, I know a lot about clouds because I used to paint <laughs> murals all over the place full of clouds. And sometimes I had to paint murals on ceilings. And so most people, they don't, they don't know what a cloud looks like from the bottom when you're looking straight up because they don't spend very much time on their back looking straight up at clouds. Um, but you know, up here, you're gonna maybe catch a little bit of the side. And then over here, you know, you're, you're, you're catching 95% or 90% bottom, sorry. Yeah, so when I, when I used to do those clouds in Vegas, you know, up in the way up high. If you look at the Caesar's Palace, a lot of those clouds, even though they're on the ceiling, look like they look like they were they look like your vantage point of looking at a cloud from the side. And that was a trick we had to do because um, those if you painted them from the bottom, people they don't understand it. It's weird. So you have to kind of paint them as if they're looking at it from the side. Weird stuff. I don't know if those uh, Caesar's Palace ones are even up there anymore. Someone painted them before me, and then I had to come back and correct them and paint them again. And then I think it was called Skyworks that painted them before me. And then, oh my gosh, they've probably been repainted over and over. I I spent a month and a half on a crane painting them in, in Hawaii. Crazy. Okay. I'm sorry, I was going to show you. Clouds. Here's a good one. So get that one to the cloud. Tick. Just, just look at all the ones of clouds. I'll use those two. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the two off to the left side of my screen, those are the two we're going to use. And we only have a couple minutes. But can you see that principle on the, on the one with the cars? In fact, we only have time to do that one, forget it. Um, on the one with the cars, can you see the principle? In the very background, as low as you can get toward the bottom, you're only catching the side, very little bottom of the cloud. As it comes toward you, you see more of the bottom and the ones at the top, mostly bottom. All right? So I know you want to paint a cloud. <laughs> Grab a color. I'm just going to take straight ultramarine blue. And let's just paint that cloud that's in the mid range off to the left. So I'm going to, I'm going to paint blue, blue background. This is just sky. I'm, a, I'm not painting the clouds that are up above it. It kind of has a flatter bottom. Something like that. Now, you're going to get really hard edges, and they are pretty crisp. But if you want to loosen those edges up a little bit, just take a little bit of water. A little bit of water on the edges, see? And it won't look like it's cut out. Also, look at that. We're getting that little bloom right there. Blooms look great around the edge of clouds. You see how I go from a scientist to like a you know, very scientific over here to very, very, uh, you know, life's like a cloud. <laughs> All right. Rob, could you move yep. your painting slightly to... Yeah, yeah let, me, let me do that. Uh, let me move that. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. I don't know why I didn't see that. I'm looking right at it. I got that kind of like corner stroke right there. <laughs> now the blue you're seeing up there looks almost like a, like a greener blue. What I'm looking at mine is more of a purple blue. I wish, I don't know if that's Chrome, I don't know if that's Zoom or if that's me. I'll keep trying to correct that. So we've got this. Now, since the light is coming from the top left, then the shadows are going to be on the bottom and to the left. And I think there's another little overlapping cloud on this, but watch how we make this. We, we do this almost just like we do the clouds. A little, couple little friends off here to the side, sorry. Those are those little floater clouds that, you know, you can see a little floating cloud off to the side there. Okay. Make yourself up a gray. Just take that blue and add the sl slightest amount of red and yellow to it. That'll make it kind of gray. And then let's give it a bottom. I'm not painting this exactly like I see it up there because there's a dark cloud in front of it. It's kind of ruining the... Uh, My perfect little lesson here. So I'll put it in like that. And then just like on the rock, I'll soften the edge there. And um, really the, big, the biggest difference between a cloud and a rock are the edges. Yeah, it's around 50-50. You might even get a little bit on this side because it's a ball. You might get a little bit of shadow over here, a little bit of shadow over there. And then I'll just use a wet brush 
to soften edges. Because this one got kind of hard. And it's just an edge game. This is this right here is something you can play with all of these. You can make them up. Maybe it's the best thing to do is to look at something first. And then make them up. If you feel like it, just do them out of your head. You get better and better at it, though, the more you do it. And just fuzzy little, round little fuzzy, you know, like when you ask a kid to draw a cloud, it'll look like this. And they'll come into it and they'll go, I might even draw some things inside like this. And literally, kits will symbolize what they draw. So this is just a symbol. They're, they're very correct, though. They're absolutely, they're correct in this. They are articulating what they're seeing very accurately. It's just that they're... Um, Um, it's more of a symbol of what they're drawing rather than a actual depiction. So in other words, if you're trying to communicate with another human and we're all like, let's say a hundred thousand, 200,000 years ago or whatever, and they would use, this is, this would communicate better than this probably. And of course it would take a lot less time and where are they going to get the pigments for this? This is just much more complicated than this. It's funny too. I have a very intellectual uh, uh, brother-in-law and, and his wife. And if we play, what's that? Is it called Pictionary or Pic? Anyway, you, you play this game with pictures and they're all intimidated by me because this is how I make my living, right? And so they're way better at it than I am because they're, they don't know, they don't know any of this complicated stuff. All they do is the extremely simple stuff. And so when they, when it's about just quick communication like that, um, I'm pretty good at it. They're actually better than me. Funny. It's funny how our brain works. So let's see. Shall we do a crit? I didn't even think about that part. I was just uh, assuming we'd want to do a crit. I had assumed we were just going to do these studies and not have a crit. See, what, what do you all think? Do, would you rather me not have a crit and just do studies for the rest of the day? Yeah, yeah, I don't think we yes. have a crit because these are exercises. So. Mm -hmm. We'll take it till twelve thirty. We'll just do more of these. Yes. I got a painting. Right. We don't send it in. Right? I'll hold on that. Yes. So then we won't send it in at twelve fifteen. We'll just we'll because the class is supposed to go to twelve thirty. So we'll just take it to here, and no crits. Okay. Well, I won't do my painting then. Thank you. <laughs> oh, are you going to do a painting? I wasn't actually going to do a painting. I, you know, I didn't even. Th I, why didn't I think of that? I don't know why I didn't think that through. I'm going to send mine in anyway. <laughs> send it in anyway, whatever. Um, I, I think that we'll just... Yeah, for the pieces and parts, why don't we just keep going? Huh. Okay, I'm, let's see which one I'm going to put on here. Get that one off. What have we got there? This one. More rocks. Rocks are the best. Trees. I thought trees. Did I, didn't I have a tree on there? Oh, I think it's underneath something. Here, let me take that off. There's that one. You you also have the autos. The cars? Hey, what do you mean autos? What's that? The cars. Oh. 
automobiles. Okay, I, I did give you guys some trees. I don't have them up here on my uh, my my thing, so I'll just tell you which one to do. Um, let's see. Over here, we got. Okay, this is number six. One six. Wow, look at that. Now, typical of a landscape. I don't know why I took the photo. I think, I would, again, oftentimes I'll take a photo of something, not because I'm trying to make a good photograph, but because I'm trying to just get that view of that, let's say, tree. So it, it might not be a greatly composed photograph, but I'm mainly taking it for um, what the, we, we often call scrap. We, I don't know why they call it photo scrap, but it, they, they just mean it to, to be used in a painting. Not, not for the whole painting itself. So, generally speaking, I wouldn't want a path going right up the center of my piece like this and right into my trees. But I, I think I like that picture of the tree, of that vantage point. So I really didn't care. Let's see. Although I will tell you, uh, I had a photographer tell me once that he goes, you, you should try to you should try to compose everything you do, even your little photo scrap things. Okay, where is it? This. Okay. All right. So, with the trees. I'm doing this. The one six, right? Where is it? All right. Um. Which one are you doing? Are you going to show us? Number, number one, and then it has a six on the end. I, I have to upload it to Zoom if I'm, I could, but... You guys were looking at your own photo, right? I would think. For me, for me once I download them, the numbers go away, so it's hard to... Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, it's the law, it's the vertical one of the... Of the uh... I think it's the only vertical one of trees. Okay. Let's go back to this side here. I'll, I'll, I'll do some drawing over here. You know what, I'm, I'm gonna shoot this out a little bit. So, on the, let's see, I like to give myself a couple of little dots, just, just so I know where I can draw. And, and these are pretty straight trees. But the thing to know about trees um, is you want to think about, let me draw it over here, arcs. <laughs> so here's what happens with trees. Um, They'll tend, even on these really, this, this might be a really good one to show you because they're, they're so straight. You'll get, as you lay them down, see the, the subtle bend to the tree and then it'll kind of bend this way and back and forth again. Every one of those is a little arc. I'm just doing the, the one off to the right. So as I put that in, uh, make sure you uh, uh, mute yourself, okay, everybody? I can hear someone back there. So those are arcs that way. 
then oftentimes with the with the branches and little stems and stuff, you'll see this kind of thing happening. Arc. Maybe arc off that way. And just keep looking around, you'll see them. They'll arc this way, they'll arc down this way. They're everywhere. Look for them. Because you could if you think in terms of these arcs, you will you will definitely step up your 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 game in trees. And so every time I lay down a stroke, I'm thinking arc. Sometimes they're violent switchbacks, sometimes they're like this. Very you know, kind of squiggly sometimes they're almost they'll turn a hard corner but the arcs are what you want to pay attention to also as trees get toward the base they will get a little bit bigger a little bit wider so they gradually the tree will gradually get uh, thinner toward the top and uh, wider. And you will see trees that that don't follow these rules exactly, but in general, that's the way things go. So we could throw in some more. Make it a little bit wider. These are very thin trees. And some of them overlap each other. You get that overlapping principle. And I've seen so much arcing in the tree, it's in the tree trunk part, but I see a lot more in the branches. Something like that. And maybe you'll have one in the background overlapping a little bit. Creating a little bit of a negative shape in here. I don't actually see that up there, but I, I mean, And so on. I just want you to be aware of this arcing thing going on. Arc, arc, that kind of thing. So as you throw these down, if you didn't know about this, this will change the way you draw trees and paint. Painting is just an extension of drawing, just so you know. Painting is you're drawing with color, that's all. And then there's the, the texture of the type of paint you're using, but basically you're drawing. You're doing all of this with paint. And I don't know how, how you guys are, but I am actually, I feel a lot more articulate and a lot more comfortable with a brush than I do with a pencil. I mean, I like, I like drawing with a pencil a lot, but I, I prefer the brush. So you'll get, you'll constantly get these Y shapes. Now this isn't also, this isn't exactly true of all trees, but if you'll look, can you see that the branches and the, the stems, whatever, reach more upward toward the top and then maybe more like this in that area and as they come up down here then maybe they're a little bit more to the side this isn't a perfect rule but check check it out it really does happen like that i mean i've seen uh, uh 
Some pine trees don't even don't even come close to following this rule. But in general, you'll find you may, maybe even toward the bottom, you might even find some bigger going downwards. That's why it is a great idea to draw and paint dead trees. We like them. Robert, you mean, uh, you mean winter trees, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, winter. winter. It's, it's, it's a great time of year. Uh, well, we're starting to get them anyway. Uh, but yeah, why? Because, you know, you, oftentimes they're so covered up with foliage, you can't see all this. So I don't know if I have any really filled out trees here. Let's see. I have a lot of dead trees. I'll draw some more. I see one tree that's pretty filled out. So, there's that tree. Oh, let me, let me see. Uh, okay. And let's try another tree. Oh, I was happy with that tree. Well, we'll, we'll paint that tree, but I mean, did you like that tree? I heard someone talk. Remember to mute. Okay, now let's do a more stout type oaky type tree, okay? So let's give it a nice fat base. Mine's about that wide. Here's my finger. Nice and fat. And let's really, let's just bow that thing over to the side like that. Oftentimes with an oak, you'll get this kind of thing happening where you'll get like that. Maybe even fatter at the bottom like that. Really fat at the bottom. <clears throat> really big, thick, stout branches and again here's that arch that arcing principle right so we could throw one out like this and they do all kinds of things they're just wonderful neandering type trees and thinner and thinner and thinner who knows i've seen him even do this you know, I've seen them do all kinds of things. They're wonderful. We can throw another one back here, maybe. I like the overlapping. See, when you when you add more overlapping. You get the one, two. It just looks, it looks more better. And again, with the arcing. Arcing, arcing. Maybe some on the front side of the tree, maybe some coming from behind. Rob, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, in one of the pictures that you sent, I think it's an ash tree, but I'm not sure. There's mm -hmm. one that whose trunk is, I think, doubled at the bottom, and one part of the trunk comes comes toward you, and one goes away. Could you show how you would draw that? Is that the one that is that the one number six, the tall one? 
Uh, it's the one that has no leaves. Oh, no leaves. Okay. Oh, oh that one. That's beautiful. The the white yeah. white trunk, the birch tree. Yeah, yes. that's a sycamore. Sycamore. So you want to see how you would? All right, they overlap each other, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So the bottom, if the bottom's there. How about finishing the oak too? <laughs> I know, huh? Yeah. And how about I, I get? I'll get to that one after this. Okay. I'll. I just wanted you to know that with the oak, I mean, my gosh, they do all kinds of things. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, you certainly, with an oak, you could have something coming off over here. See, I, I just overlap. Pull behind, up to and behind, up to and behind. I do the same thing when I paint. I'll, I'll take this branch right over that one. Like that. The, this is, what I call this is a tree skeleton. So without the leaves, you can see what the branches actually do. Anyway, now if you'll notice that uh, For some reason, I don't know why that is, but uh, the the trees that are native to California are I, I've, uh, the oak and the sycamore. I've got some sycamores. That the one that you wanted me to draw on, the, on this one, the second one, uh, the one I'll demo next. That's a sycamore. They're very very windy trees. The oaks are too. So so it's important to know about this arcing thing. It's also important to ha have some overlapping. So something's coming at you. Like this one, you know, if you can see, this one is on the other side. So it feels like it's kind of going away from us. You know, occasionally you'll have some branches and whatever that actually come at you. Not very many though, but you'll have a few. So that's important. Also, uh, this this idea of. I'm gonna draw this really small right beside it. But let, let's just say, if the light is coming from this direction, and you have an oak, it kind of looks like this. Pretty familiar sight around here. Um, that most of your light's gonna hit on this side, you know, maybe a little bit on this side here. And then this goes into shadow. All that goes into shadow. Very much like a rock. And then at the end, it's just how do you treat the edge? What, what do the edges of this type of tree do, you know? In fact, some people, when they're drawing this out, will do this. We'll just go, okay, I've got, I've got this. Let's just say it kind of goes like that. Okay, I've got a shadow there. I've got a shadow there. And so these things are in shadow. And they'll literally paint them in like that and then come back and just fuzz the edges and there it goes, there's the tree. This is this would be a little bit more organic approach. This is a little more geometric. As you can tell, I love everything. The, the geometric really cuts through all the 
all the detail and goes straight for the form, so. I know this is all hypothetical because we're not really drawing any. I mean, we're not, we're not looking at a photograph. Remember, these photographs I'm using too are just only reference. So, let's, let's get back to that sycamore. That would be number 111. Okay. So, let's see. All right, we have one that's... No. <laughs> the tree will act like a human body in a lot of ways. If you'll notice, this tree is actually bending toward us. So the, the first part of it, let's just let's just put it like this, kind of comes up and up, and up, and it kind of bends toward us. That's why you get these overlapping, they give it away, see? These little bends in it going this way are, are giving away which way it's overlapping. Because if it were bending the other way, it would do this. These would go around this way. It's kind of bending at us. It bends at us. And then this part that goes way off over here is actually going away from us again. In that direction. Or is this one's kind of coming at us a little bit more in that? It's leaning at us. I don't know if you can see that too well, sorry. It's just kind of coming over. Like that. We've got this other little guy coming off over here. It looks like a lightning bolt toward the top. Just see all those little arcs in it? Arc. And so on. Now this one in the background, this other one just kind of goes up like this. It's very, not a lot of arcing in it, a little bit. And I think, wow, it actually comes over to the other side of it. So it's that, it's this wide at the base. Wow. That's really wide. I think I painted this tree. Yes, I have painted this tree. Whoops, you got a little. Now, sometimes that'll happen to you where you got a little bit too wide on it. Just, you know what I do? I just, I just chop it out like this. <laughs> and I'll either make it into something else or you wouldn't believe how it just turns into something else. If it totally doesn't work, I just uh, throw it and start another one. No. <laughs> I just uh, get a little bit of uh, gouache on it. Let's paint it. Let's paint this one. We're going to do the same one. It's a very white tree. These are called white sycamores. They're so, I mean, sometimes they're so white. They're as light as any cloud. I mean, it is extremely bright. So, with very little paint, you need a little bit on there. Uh, let me let me make sure I can see what you're seeing. Hmm. Okay. Um, let me make this smaller. Okay. So. I'm just gonna see how light my 
I'm hardly using any water, just a little bit of gray in that. I'm doing this one toward the top that kind of goes up like that. And it's very light. And I got this other one. And it kind of goes up and it bends around and then it kind of comes up over here and whoops, got a little fat with it there. Up and around this way. When you're drawing a light tree or painting a light tree, it's not easy to see everything. And some places where it gets really bright, you might want to just dab it a little bit like that toward the bottom. But up here, it gets a little darker, so we'll be able to see a little bit more. And I've got a really, this is interesting, this tree it goes from like white to black up here. I've got this. Now they made a little mistake there. Who, who you know what? That could easily turn into another branch going like that. So you need to learn to roll with the when you're doing trees. It doesn't have to be identical to the tree you're doing. I mean, I, I know there's photo realists out there that want to make everything identical, but if that's what you want, then absolutely correct all of your mistakes. I tend to improvise everything. And my, my, my way of doing things is every, the way you improvise is your style. So why would you want to cover that up? I, I just don't understand why, but you got this rounder one over here and that and so on. We won't do every branch. There's a whole lot on there, but if you lay it out light like this, now we can come back with the shadow and it's a pretty dark shadow. I mean, that's a pretty gray shadow too, so. I mean, Prussian blue and cad red make a pretty nice gray. What I do is I, I try not to get them even so I get it a little bit on the purpley side. Purpley. <laughs> I'm always telling everybody to say violet, and yes, I do say purple. Okay. Now, here's another thing. If, if you keep, keep a nice damp brush off to the side, you know what we can do is just start with these little rings. And then if you'll notice on the right side is where most of the shadow is. Some places you're not seeing very much light shadow. Not seeing too much shadow some places. I'll just put it in like that. And with a damp brush. Let's get that in there. Some of these ones. So that one's catching mostly, I guess that's mostly in shadow because it's coming at us maybe. The bottom of this branch is in shadow. And then it gets all dark. I don't know if there's a cloud casting a shadow over this or what. And who knows, you get sort of the bottom of things, the right side of things. And you could just use a wet brush if your edges get too razor sharp, you can just use a wet brush and soften them.
and we could just keep doing this all day. I noticed some of those branches are really dark, and it, I don't think it's because the branch itself is dark. I think it's because it's mostly in shadow, and you're looking at mostly the bottom of it. See, now as it bends toward the light, it gets mostly in light. Might catch a little bit of something on the right side of it. Beautiful little negative shapes in there too. They've got little twigs in there. So. My fun is the funnest part. Here's my, my, my secret is hold the brush way back and in a very loose manner. Okay, very loose. And I just, I just let them happen. I don't even, I look what's up there and I, I, might, I might copy it if I need a guide, but oftentimes I don't need a guide and I just do it on my own. I just kind of like. <laughs> the other secret to trade secret there is not only hold it loose, but barely, barely, barely skim. So just barely skim the surface. So you'll see me oftentimes I'll miss, I'll miss, I'll miss, I'll miss, and then I catch it. And the reason why is because I'm trying to just skim the surface. That's what will give you that really, really light touch. Like that. Occasionally I like to take a, a twig like this and bring it behind for the overlapping. So all my branches aren't out to the sides. Occasionally you'll get a branch overlapping another branch. <clears throat> and it happens a lot more than you think. If you have too much overlapping, it'll get confusing. So you, you know, you just, one of the reasons we put the branches all off to the sides is because we don't want that confusion, but you, you need some, or it looks kind of, uh, You know, you know, we've all looked at our paintings and go, ah, what's wrong with this thing? I'm not sure. Almost always it's, it comes down to some of the big design things like overlapping is a big, big design principle. Tangents can be a big, you know, sometimes it's just the way you're looking at something. It's tangent to the other thing. So that means that it's not clearly overlapping. It just comes right up to something, but not clearly. Like if I were to, if I were to put another tr tree branch like this, you see, you just see the alignment, how it runs? That's weird, right? You're kind of going, what the heck's going on there, Rob? Uh, what is that? There was a, so you, you've got a branch that's, that's running along this side of another branch and then goes off and does its own thing. That's, that's really kind of a tangent and it makes the viewer feel uncomfortable and it makes, you know, you'll even look at it yourself and go, oh, what did I do there? Or what's wrong with this piece? I can't, I don't even know what's wrong with this piece. So anyway, I'm going to put a little bit of a shadow on the side of this one like that. Let's go like that. And maybe just with a soft, with a really damp brush. It'll just leak into the wetness and um, give me a soft edge. And th these are pretty sparse trees as far as foliage goes. So you actually do see individual leaves. Um, you usually you don't, but I, I really love this, this kind of thing. So if you mix yourself up a uh, I would use Prussian blue, cad yellow, and let's just try some magenta. Why not? Some greens. Now here's what I think about when I think when I, especially when I paint leaves like this, it may even behoove you to do a little bit of a sketch first. Like if I go over here, let's say I'll go on my sketch page here. 
and I'm noticing that the trees, the, the, those leaves make a shape kind of like this. Etc. So, something in that order. I'll do that. Sometimes you see the, the, that's when it's facing you. But sometimes they bend over and you see them from the side and they're doing more of this kind of thing. Like that. You make it one from the other side, etc. So, um, so you'll get some from the front, front, some from the sides, you know, you'll get, but those are the two main angles. And it look, in this case, it kind of looks like a hand. Or I'll, 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 they also look like, like bird feathers or something like that. So I'll think about that as I'm putting down my leaf shapes. And just come up with a, a nice color, kind of a brown green, you know. Again, I'm using uh, Prussian blue. Either yellow, either red. And uh, the shape, so I'll just do a big one here. The shape kind of looks like that. That kind of deal. That, that's an awfully big one, right? So as I put down these little shapes, I'm thinking of this. Some of them clump together and you'll get a little mass of them. Some of them are all by themselves. Some of them lean, uh, you, you're only catching the side of them, so it'll look like this. Okay, you see how much easier it is to draw with a brush than it is <laughs> with all that line? I love line though, don't get me wrong. I find this so easy. Just let that brush do it. The brush is sitting there like a, it, it's sitting there like a, like a dog salivating, you know? It wants to play. So you let it play. Hold it loose in your hand and just tickle it. Just touch, 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 touch. They all kind of, some go off to the side, some go straight up. They make little shapes like that. Occasionally you'll get one all by itself. In this case, they're so sparse that you'll get a few by themselves. You, you just treat it like that and... It's the brush. I'm not saying this brush, I could do it with a junk brush. Here's a, here's a piece of junk brush. This is nothing, nothing special at all. This is like a five dollar brush okay it's not the brush it's it's your at it's the attitude watch see now having a better brush will give you you know you can hold more paint it has a better tip all all kinds of things but you can still get great effects with not the greatest brush it's more of an attitude than it is a technical thing. It's a spiritual thing. You just, I hate to, I mean, I know I sound like a, maybe a Zen Buddhist here. I mean, landscape painting is, <laughs> I, I think Zen Buddhism is, a, is, is such a natural uh, way of thinking. To be at one with what you're doing, just, but really it is. Rob, I just learned a word uh, in learning any uh, expertise. Is they call it a mental representation? Mental representation, and it's called how do you say it? Yeah, mental representation. This oh. is mental. Mental rep representation. In in our case, it's the image in your mind. Um, right. Or the you know, it's not the, the concrete image of the leaf. It's the it's the overall. You know, just uh, like you. 
it's good to learn your mental representation here. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it just is. like uh, uh, you learn music, you have to sing it in your mind. The, the mental uh, music, you know. We, we, yeah. yeah. We have to develop this, uh, this mental uh, image. It's, it could be abstract, could be uh, concrete, but it's a mental image. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's fantastic. Mental representation. Fantastic way, way of putting it. <clears throat> now that's the thing. I don't know where I learned that, but I learned that really young. Or somehow I held on to that. Maybe all kids know that, you know? You don't have to tell a kid how to... Well, maybe some kids, I don't know. But... A lot of this stuff is very natural. I think a lot of this isn't, isn't learning it. I think a lot of it's actually getting back to it. So... So again, we have some all by themselves, some overlapping, and look, and you can do these really fast too, by the way. I just kind of go like this. And they almost look better if you do them fast. And I know I have a lot there. Just see how they, say we did this tree pieces and parts. You don't have to do the whole tree. Just make steadies. Aren't steadies great? They're wonderful. They might even make really great things to frame and put on your wall. You don't always have to do this big finish thing. And I know I kind of teach that, but I just want to let you know that this, this kind of thing can be absolutely beautiful. I and mean, how, what a wonderful thing to put on your wall too, right? I mean, not that I was trying to make this wonderful piece of artwork here, but but I was studying to do it. And in that study, I was almost meditating. What a wonderful thing to see on your a meditation, a visual meditation. How's that? A mental representation. I love that. So just fun. You should just play like this. Just play with with your brush. Practicing strokes, leaves are fantastic. Um, grasses, like this, let's just say this is a bunch of grass. Overlap. All these things are just wonderful things to practice with. See? You can go around in your sketchbook and make these kind of uh, observations very free and intuitive like this. And just go from a tree to, uh, to grasses, to rocks. I, I love a page, a page like this. I know people don't think to frame anything like that on, and put it on a wall, but you know, nowadays, I think it's pretty much, you make the rules, you know? I think something like that can be wonderful. I mean, just, just as a, a piece of artwork in itself. I mean, you've got, you've got a lot of steady in there and you've got, you've got a lot of uh, intuition. Look what the brush is doing there. Look at these. I had no idea that was gonna happen. That's just the magic of watercolor happening right there on those edges. You know, it could be that, that easy. Yes, folks. It's that easy. Um, oh. Let's see what else here. Hey, how about we go back to our little, oh, where is it? The rock sample that we started off with? There it is. That one? You see the brush at the very top? You know, doesn't it look really, 
almost kind of boring. I think that is one of the most important things to learn. So how about we, we put a little rock in front of it. Let's just do it right here on this page because, because I, I, like I said, I love, I love a page that just has a bunch of studies on it. And I'm going to throw my little rock there on the top like this. There's some other things down below it. And I'm going to dab it with my paper towel. Like that. Oops. And that gives me like a side plane and a bottom plane right there. You can make those just kind of gives it something you can even put more rocks in there if you like let's take a gray it's kind of a all that brush is kind of a gray color you know it doesn't even matter what gray you use just just take all your red yellow and blue put it together infinite amount of colors you can make but just red yellow and blue put them together Now I've got a kind of a redder gray. Now I've got a greener gray. Who cares? Whatever gray you like. And I got my brush. Here, I'm gonna zoom in on this. I got my brush. And I'm painting brush, <laughs> but it's true, right? And I can just cut, cut in. Now I'm cutting. I'm actually drawing the top part of my rock here with the background. We call that negative painting. Just articulating my shape with the uh, with the background. Now I'm going to take the side of my brush and just pull up. Like that. I don't know why I always have to make the noise. Sorry. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Multi uh, sensory. Okay. I do that in every painting, every painting. Now we have the little sticks that come out of the top. Let's, let's just use our branch trick. We just did very delicate light strokes. You'll see me oftentimes I'll miss it a couple of times. If it's, if the stroke is too fat, maybe you got too much water in there. Just overlap them. See, occasionally I put in a diagonal one or a, even a horizontal one like that. Just like everything else, because because they get more condensed and there's not as much light hitting there, you'll get darker toward the bottom. As you can see, I'll say that literally every time we do a painting. So I just put it in like that, nice and dark, right over what I did. And then just Stroke that out into the, 
I got dry brush gradation. Certainly vary the colors in there. Occasionally throw in something kind of yellow. The dry brush gradation, uh, we, I, I use the word rubbing. Rubbing? Oh. Yeah. And all you're doing in a, in a, in a dry brush gradation, all you're doing is like that. And then you're getting a little bit darker. Yeah, the the point is to keep it uh, kind of a, a loose, uh, yeah. soft, yeah, but uh, not so soft like a fluffy. <laughs> it's just right. the just the opposite of a, a smoothness, a shininess. Right. So that's all we're doing is we're just going from dark to light, maybe even darker in here now. And I do that in weeds, you just saw me do it in rocks, I do it in... So this is why gradations, gradations are so important, and the type of stroke, the, 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 the manner, um, the, the technique. So there's dry brushing. Um, And then you oftentimes you'll have wet wet into wet color. So we got this. You have two colors that are right next to each other. When you put them into each other, they'll move into each other, and you'll get that kind of bloom effect in there. That's wet into wet. And then if I if I take a color over this that you can see through like this. You know, sometimes I wor I'm worried that some of my, my more experienced painters in here find this boring, but I have to tell you, I don't think you do because I don't. <laughs> I sure don't. I love it. So you can see how I'm taking a little bit of yellow over that, but you can still see what's underneath it. Yellowy orange. So that's a glaze when you can see right through the color into another color. So you've got you've got glazing, wet into wet, and dry brushing. You should just practice those on your own all the time. Just play with them all the time. You'll get there's just millions of combinations, and those are the three major techniques of watercolor. There's only three. There's minor ones, you know, like rubbing things out. Um, you could even put op opaque stuff in there. I can scratch things out. People add glitter to it. People add alcohol to it. People add whatever. Something dark at the base there. Oftentimes when I'm playing, I'll ground things with a little bit of something dark underneath them. Like this. Kaboom, 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 like that. Just sits it down. You see how, the, how my rock almost feels like it's floating a little bit because it doesn't have any overlapping. So I'll throw in a couple of grassy things around the top of it. Just to kind of tuck it in. That's what I do. Tuck things in. Rob? Yes? This is Ethel. What about the shadow underneath? I know you got dark under there, but wouldn't there be a little shadow? You mean underneath the rock? Yeah, well, from where the light is coming? Well, I do have a little shadow on the left side. Maybe it's not dark enough. On the rock, but I'm thinking about on the ground. 
Oh, you mean a cast shadow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Sure. Yeah, it depends on what. Some sometimes a day now you wouldn't get much of a cast shadow. Like at high noon, you know, probably you know it's you you won't see too much. But let's say it's later in the day. Just take a little color. If the light's coming from here, now let's put a long shadow on it. Real late in the day. You know, if there's grasses and things too, they, they might cast little shadows too, so you might have a fuzzy edge to it. So nice and dark at the base. Yeah, maybe maybe the shadow's a little darker. And I'm just lightening up as it gets further away, keep it darker as it gets underneath. Now, when we go into other subject matters, you almost always have one or all of these things in a painting depending on what we're doing you know i mean obviously when we did our painting of remember we did the one in cuba where the people were walking around you don't really get too much of this stuff but still the principles of overlapping and, and sitting things down with shadows and cast shadows that all applies everywhere so i want you, you all to keep uh, nice photo of an elk. Wow, you guys really got the chat going here, didn't you? I didn't look at the chat. Uh, pigment. Another source for pigment analysis. Good. Very nice. Nice tree. All right, I'll keep those up. It is a beautiful tree. I'm just looking at your chats there. Um, you know, Claire, that, that tree you see there, is that a painting? Or someone just went really crazy with the... Uh... No, it's a photo of... Oh, wow. So, we, uh, if you go to... Um, you know, there's a few places around here you can see something like that, but... Uh, Desconzo Gardens has a really nice little oak grove where they, they it's almost like cathedral. You're inside of this huge cathedral. That is an amazing oak though, wow. Carolina, South Carolina, wow. Beautiful. Did you guys want me to share that with you? I, I know I'm, I'm looking at it going, wow, you see it? And then there was this other Here's the uh, information on color, pigments, pigmentations, and paints. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh, okay. So this is telling you where the colors come from. Great. The yellows. Oh, that is great. Very informative page. Just tap on the link in the chat, you all, if you want this, and then um, it'll come up and you can just bookmark it. Wonderful. Um, reds. Yeah, so cadmium, you know, as you know, cadmiums, cadmium is a metal. So if you do get it on your fingers, just wash your hands. Don't put it in your mouth. Try to avoid getting it on you, though, when you're dealing with pure cadmium. Uh, if you can, you rarely ever see anything with lead in it anymore, but th there's a couple of oil colors with lead in them. And you you want to avoid those or use them. I love the way they feel. Um, that would be uh, cremids white and uh, flake white. And... Uh, you know, as, you don't get, as long as you don't get it on you, you wash your hands, work in a well-ventilated area, you're fine. But it's not the kind of thing that I would want to be doing. Uh, if you know who Lucian Freud, the artist, is, uh, he used flake white and Kremitz white 
exclusively, and he what he lived into his nineties. I think he almost made a hundred. So, and he used that almost every day. So I think you know you you just have to be careful. Yeah, don't eat it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. That was a great day. I can't wait Thanks to so. use some of this stuff in some paintings. Uh, please keep great. and please keep sending me ideas because I want to. I want. I want to do what you want to do. You know, I have a lot of ideas already. So, but keep sending me ideas. I think we wanted to do that master, right? Yes. Like the yeah. Zorn. People like the Zorn idea. Yes. There. Yep. He's complicated, so, but I'll walk you through the steps. Um, it's just the way he uses white is very informative. Very informative. So, I think we might go for that next week. Okay, keep thank giving you. Me, me your ideas. I, I love that. Great I want to class. customize this class toward you. What was the question? Excuse me? No, I said great class. Oh, Thanks. thank you. Great class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Great class. Thank you all very much. That was a great day. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Okay. Let me. Okay, thank everybody watching this uh, this uh, video lesson with me, um, and I will be teaching a uh, Chinese uh, landscape classical landscape painting tomorrow. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very interesting comparison study of a Chinese master in Qing Dynasty. Um, with uh, the post imp uh, impressionist uh, French artist uh, Cezanne. Um, Wang Yanqi is known as the Chinese Cezanne. So see you tomorrow. Stay tuned.